is Sophia Smallstorm. I am back with another podcast, and my guest today is a very special personality. People have raved about her to me, and I listened to a couple of her shows, and then the other day I stumbled across a video she had made, and she really has a tremendous breadth of knowledge about a lot of different things and a depth of knowledge. So I'm going to bring you now DJ. Are you there? Yes, Sophie, I am. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. I, you know, everybody's talking about you, and I was very happy to be able to get in contact with you. Um, it was a novel experience to talk for the first time, and we followed up a couple more times, and then I had proposed this interview because I had come across um, a video that you did, and I believe that's the Level 9 News YouTube channel, right? Uh, yeah, I started off on uh, YouTube, but then moved to Level 9 News now has its own website, which is level, the number 9, news.com. I've moved all my research papers and everything over there. Because what was happening that I found was that um, I've been posting this research work on, on YouTube, and um, I'm probably like everybody else, and I never bothered to read those EULA agreements. I mean, they just go on forever. And I tried to post a couple of my more recent videos onto live leaks and got hit with a copyright violation three times from Google. Google had copyrighted my work, so it couldn't be distributed. Wait, Google copy copyrighted your work? Yep, because so in the, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that's pretty astounding that, you know, this entity can come in and copyright our work. Right, and yours too. You know, if you put, um, um, intellectual material up there that you went and you spent the time to research and you put it into a format that people can understand. If you read that EULA agreement, you know, instead of just clicking accept, actually read through it, there's a section in there that says Google, which was YouTube, maintains all copyright to the material published on their site. So if they decide to allow you to publish it, it that comes their intellectual material. All right. I'm not hearing you. Yeah, I'm having problems here, too. Well, now it's come back, so that's nice. We are having a few Skype problems today, not surprising. But uh, we'll try. We'll try to do this podcast, and if people would just be kind enough to bear with us, um, if there is a glitch or two or three. So this Go so Google claims, um, once you sign this agreement, that it has the copyright ownership to what's posted on its, pus published on its websites, right? Yes, it maintains the, um, the right to any intellectual property you put up there. That's crazy. That's not right. I mean, because I tried to publish a lot of this stuff about the AI that was behind the Jade Helm exercise regarding the Jade 2 software, and I thought it was important enough, well, maybe I should also try and put it on live leads, and um, we tried to post it up there, and within 24 hours, the three videos that we tried to post came back with, sorry, but your post has been denied due to copyright claim filed by Google. All right. So when you take it off Google, presumably once you put it up and you sign the agreement, you retain the right to take it off, right? But they still maintain the copyright. And if they find that codec or they're, they're running an algorithm to, uh, you know, a, say a video report because everybody posts video to YouTube and they find a match somewhere else, Google can actually, if they don't like the material, they can petition the site or the entity that you're trying to republish the information on and hit them with a copyright violation. It's kind of like Facebook, for, Sophia. I don't know if you use Facebook. I try and stay away from it. But have you ever tried to delete an account on Facebook? It's no, their, I don't have Yeah, well, stay away from it. It's their property. Anything you paste a post on there, 
belongs to them from that point forward. And I know that my fiancé, he tried to um, delete his Facebook account, deactivate. You can deactivate it, but all the stuff you ever posted up there prior to the deactivation is still there. There's well, no I believe pivot. that. It's just disturbing to think that they claim ownership of your material when you've posted it on Google. So anyway, should we just try to move on? Because these people, it's like, you know, having claws dig into you. And the more you describe the pain, <laughs> the worse it gets. <laughs> yeah. So you were telling me yesterday a little bit about your background. And why don't you tell us that, and then we'll soar onward into G-A-M-I-N-G. Okay. Um, my background, you know, I have degrees in um, business management and economic finance. And then, you know, I went on, I um, got my academic training and my certifications in the area of systems and network engineering. And for a while, I worked in the oil and gas and power distribution industries where I was a consultant. And I primarily was involved in oil and gas and distribution pipelines that utilize, well, they pretty much all do, but SCADA systems, which are supervisory control and data acquisition systems that are run by what's known as RTUs, remote terminal units. So I, I had done that for years, which was why I got, you know, involved in not only the Fukushima, you know, digging into that, but also the Gulf of Mexico thing that had happened. Um, let's see. From there, I went, went on. I worked in the gaming industry for quite some time and learned some very interesting things about the subliminal tools that are built into these um, gaming machines, the slot machines, that mm -hmm. are designed to pretty much hook people. So the flickering, um, there's a frequency-based modulation of human consciousness in these casinos? It's a frequency-based modulation. It's a signal that is coming off those machines that when your optic nerve is picking up this signal, okay, it goes to the brain, which triggers the brain to produce and excrete a chemical that is pretty much identical to Valium. So your brain is releasing... Uh, well, Valium, as I understand it, is uh, something that calms you down and relaxes you and sedates you. Right. And so what the brain is making a similar chemical. Correct. When, because of these frequencies. So the frequencies are stimulating this neurochemical production in the brain. And that's yeah. ongoing. And then, then what happens? Well, just like, you know, you hear people getting addicted to prescription drugs, like Valium was a problem for quite some time because anybody could get it and they were abusing it and taking more and more and more. I mean, that's the effect of any type of an endorphin type of drug that you take. You want more. Same thing with heroin. And um, I guess the, the industry pretty much found that, you know, there is a certain um, vibrational frequency that, if these screens, let's call them on these machines, are tuned to emit, it will have a similar type of drug-like effect on the person that is sitting in front of it for hours and hours, and some of them even for days. So as you play these machines and you get this nice, woozy feeling from being there because of these frequencies, even though you're losing money, and most people are, it addicts you to the experience, which makes you want to always go back to the casino and lose money, right? Pretty much, yeah. It's, it's an addictive experience, um, just like 
drug abuse or alcohol abuse or even prescription narcotic abuse. Well, that's very, very sad. And that makes you wonder where else this is showing up, where else there are these, you know, frequencies through lights and um, other methods. I'm going to tell you a little story. I was caught in O'Hare Airport uh, a few years ago, and it was when we had wildfires here in Southern California, and I had to come back from the East Coast. And O'Hare was a huge mess. It is the hub of United. It's a very big airport in Chicago. And you would have thought that people would be beside themselves, screaming and yelling at the gates and the ticket counters because there were so many planes delayed. There was an Air France plane. The people had been waiting now nearly 24 hours because they were trying to catch a connecting flight. Um, they had gotten off Air France, and I don't know what plane they were going to get on. But anyway, my plane was the, – the boarding time was changed several times. And I wandered around the airport, and I bought some chamomile tea, and I had a magazine to read. And I was really surprised that I was in such a relaxed mood. And I couldn't figure it out because normally nobody takes that kind of delay experience well. And then I noticed that where I was wandering in the airport, there were some very pungent, beautiful smells. And there was a smell of roses, and I looked around to see who was wearing this rose perfume, and there was absolutely nobody around me. And then I smelled vanilla, and I thought, well, maybe they're baking something. There's a Mrs. Fields cookies, and there was nothing. And I smelled these beautiful aromas the whole time I was in O'Hare. And it occurred to me while I was on my plane that that was a sedation experiment on the people in O'Hare, possibly. I mean, I have no proof. All I can tell you is I was smelling it all over the airport and nobody was around me and there were no shops that had that kind of activity going on. And there was a neuro, um, neuro I think it was like neurobiology conference that was happening in San Diego, and I could tell the plane was full of people going to that conference because I was sitting next to one of them at the gate. And I saw her in San Diego at the airport at the baggage claim, and I asked her if she smelled these smells. And I mentioned my theory to her, and she said it could have been very possible because even she and all her conference you know, pals had not been stressed out at all. You know, it's funny you mentioned that, too, because going back to the gaming industry, a lot of these <clears throat> casinos, what they do is, you ever notice there's no windows in casinos? You know, they have a closed ventilation system, you know, just like any other type of high-rise building, whatever, where you can't open the windows or get any fresh air from the outside. But um, one of the things that they have been known to do is to pump pheromones through the ventilation system to keep people um, attracted to the environment that they're in. I don't know if that's the right word, but it sounds a lot like what you were experiencing, the experience that you had in the airport with smells, you know, because they affect the brain too. All of your sensory um, intake mechanisms in the human body eventually end up at the brain. And depending um, – what type of sensory stimulation, you know, you're receiving in the brain, you know, probably has a profound effect on, you know, what chemicals are being triggered in the brain and then being released into the body, just like you said. Right. Well, our um, cell receptors change the more we produce certain kinds of emotions. And as we have certain kinds of experiences, we, we almost like garden or groom our cell receptors for those particular neurochemicals. And I learned this from the movie What the Bleep, which I saw many, many years ago. Remember that movie? No. What the Bleep do we know? Very popular film, and I saw it about seven times and took copious notes. But um, it was part of the whole consciousness movement, you could say. But there was a lot of um, neurochemistry in it, and it featured some very well-known experts in psychiatry, psychology, neurology, 
and then of course the New Age movement too. But anyway, one of the things I learned from that movie was if you're constantly angry or constantly upset or constantly depressed, this has to do with neurochemical production and that the cell receptors become attuned to those particular chemicals and they won't even recognize happiness chemicals, for instance. Um, I know I'm using very simplified words, but uh, we have all kinds of chemical um, uh, compounds that we release that go with attitudes, moods, and states of being, states of mind, emotional states. So I'm guessing that this, the pheromone pumping that you're talking about creates a state of arousal which could maybe even be semi-sexual, a little bit excited, something like that. And that's considered a, a heightened, pleasurable state. And so then people want to get in that, that frame, and they want to go to the place that makes them feel that way. And I've noticed that in certain restaurants, you know, when you sit down and the ambiance is really nice and they're playing like jazz in the background, soft tinkling um, music, and everybody around you is in this relaxed, somewhat, um, it's like a heightened expect, state of expectation. You're going to eat. You're going to have a really nice experience. You feel good. You feel like, oh, good, I should be doing this. I'm in a nice place. I want to be able to come back here again. And I don't know how restaurants create this, but the creation of mood is a very important marketing strategy. And I can see that casinos would do it. Airports will do it in order not to um, have a lot of angry passengers. And department stores, it, the list is endless, you know? Mm. I'd like to touch upon um, an observation you just made as far as uh, you said about the neural receptors. You know, if you're constantly angry, these receptors won't recognize happiness or calmness and, you know, that goes for many other states of being. I think me coming from my world and what I do, um, that sounds a lot like in training, how you entrain um, electrical frequencies to lock onto a certain wavelength, so to speak, right. and just boom, it locks into it. It ignores frequencies, you know, above or below it. That's called entrainment. So, and our bodies are bioelectrical. Right. No, that's, that's the right term for it, I'm sure. And I don't know, maybe you can enlighten us, but what is the relationship between emotions, chemicals that, that, a company and emotion or are created when one has an emotion and frequencies? Well, chemicals have certain frequency properties in them. Um, so when you're talking about, let me back up a minute, with, with all this new stuff that they're doing, and I talked a lot about it with the J2 software, um, and then found out a lot more, the research they're doing with what they call remote neural monitoring, where they can use RF, microwave, um, wireless technology to actually target individuals. And by manipulating the frequencies that are being broadcast, they can change the electrical or frequency signal of the brain in order to invoke a particular emotion, a particular sensation, um, biological functions. This is all under the category of remote neural monitoring. You've heard MK Ultra, right? You know, oh boy, have I? Okay. Well, what this is, is MK Ultra, without the use of the chemicals, the drugs, or the handler. It's direct. You know, mm -hmm. from transmitter to target individual's brain. So I've been reading an article, actually, by somebody who wrote it a few years ago. He just, uh, we, we were talking about it last night, and 
it's very, very disturbing about, you know, military assets who have been mind controlled. They put them in hotel rooms and they just keep them there by themselves for long periods of time and they manipulate them. It's a, you know, there's torture and uh, stuff like that included. Um, but this microwave manipulation of the brain is something that I think is very, very alarming to a lot of people who are learning about it because it seems like it's something you absolutely cannot get away from. So I'm going to ask you this, and maybe it's kind of a dumb question, but I'd like to know what you think. Is there a way that you can, you know, harden yourself, inure yourself, prevent, protect your brain through your own will um, against this kind of intrusion? That's a very good question. Very good question. You know, I'm coming uh, to the understanding that one of the ways to do that is to train yourself, practice, you know, do exercises on how to focus. You know how they uh, talk about ADD kids, you know, they can't read, they can't study unless there's a lot of noise going back, going on in the background and stuff like that versus other kids if, you know, the same type of external stimuli is going going on in the background, they can't focus. We need to be able to train our minds to focus on what we intend to focus on and not, you know, these intrusive um, stimuli that are coming in. So do we know when there's an intrusive uh, frequency pattern uh, affecting us? Besides, you know, I've learned from my um, dabbling in the world of wireless radiation that a lot of the symptoms that people experience when they're being blasted by their router from their bedroom or wherever they keep it, or even their cordless phone, their DECT phone, Digital Enhanced Cordless Technology, which are 5 gigahertz, 6, 7 gigahertz now, mm -hmm. uh, that's billion hertz. People don't realize that the jostling and jolting that their cells are feeling at night, particularly their brain cells, because what's happening is we go into very deep restorative cellular cycles, repair cycles while we sleep. That's why we have to sleep. I've said this before on shows. We absolutely have to lie down and not move for seven or eight hours every single day so that our body can repair itself properly and deeply. And so when you jolt and jostle your cells with microwaves at night, you have a very restless night. So many people tell me they're habitual insomniacs. And this feeling of restlessness and stress and agitation is never attributed to microwaves coming from what people believe to be harmless, you know, electronic devices that nobody can live without, like computers and phones. But so... It takes pointing it out to them to say, listen, just try an experiment. Turn your router off at night and unplug the phone and then see how you feel, how you sleep. And then they, they get the awareness. So the microwaves, I'm, I'm calling them microwaves, the frequencies that are used to target us through this mind control MK Ultra that you're describing. How do you tell? I've uh, spoken to a couple of people who, you know, have, have claimed to be victims of this type of technology. And what they have told me is they can't tell when it's happening to them. But if they are cognizant enough and aware of their, their own um, physiology, they are aware enough to realize they are getting confused. They can't put together sentences. Um, you know, they have trouble focusing on things that they're either reading or, or trying to um, look up on the computer. But, see, those symptoms are so common and cover such a broad spectrum of things that everybody experiences at one time or another, not to take credibility away from what they're going through and what they're suffering from. It is, I guess what I'm trying to say, it's more or less of a, a very subtle type of thing. Right. I mean, that's what I believe. And we don't know then if it's that subtle how many of us 
are experiencing that because mm-hmm. it's it's plausible that this is a very widespread experiment. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. And as you were mentioning before about all of the microwave and RF and wireless uh, uh, frequency pollution that we're all being exposed to, what that amounts to is you're during the waking day, I guess, you're being overstimulated from an external source. So by the time, you know, you're ready to go to bed and you may even be exhausted by that time, your mind has been so overstimulated that it it can't, I guess the word would be like wind down, diffuse, you know, so people are having a lot of trouble, as you pointed out, you know, sleeping, resting, relaxing. And as you quite rightly pointed out, your body needs that rest in the REM state, the deep sleep state, you know, to do the cellular repair and stuff that it needs. Right. Um, I also learned, this is just an aside, and I hope that you don't mind if I drop some of these asides into our discussion, but in the old days, there used to be this thing that they now call biphasic sleep. People didn't plop down in bed at 10 or 11 at night and sleep solidly until 5 or 6 in the morning. People actually slept in two phases. And I wrote a newsletter about this a while ago because it was so interesting to me. And I had been experiencing it, and a lot of people experience it, and they think there's something wrong with them. But you'll fall asleep, and you'll have four or five hours of very good quality sleep. And you'll wake up at It could be anything. Usually it's about 1 in the morning, and you're wide awake, and that's when your brain starts going. You're thinking and tossing and turning. And in the old days, people used to get up. They used to go outside and play under the moonlight. They would have a snack. They would sit and talk. Remember, people slept in rooms with a lot of other people. They didn't just uh, have their own bedroom like we do. And this is why the four-poster bed with the drapes around it was developed so you could have privacy while you slept and also uh, prevent drafts from getting at you. But this biphasic sleep is apparently very normal and people who experience it should not be worried. It is a natural way to sleep and after two or three hours you will drop back to sleep and sleep a whole different kind of sleep until the morning. So, you know, we have a whole wholly different comprehension of going to bed at night and sleeping. We really think we should um, thrust ourselves into this corridor of sleep that lasts several hours until the morning without interruption. And we get freaked out if our brain wakes up and says, hi, what should I do now? Mm-hmm. And we have all kinds of pharmaceutical industries peddling drugs. You know, if you can't sleep at night, here, take this to help you get your mandatory seven or eight hours sleep. I'm glad you mentioned that because I have that problem myself where I'll fall asleep for three or four hours and then get up and feel like I have to do something, you know, and I'll piddle around and do whatever, and then I just go back to bed and go to sleep again. So. It's very normal. It's very, very normal. And I've run into people like myself. I don't like to turn the light on in the middle of the night because – That confuses me even more. Remember, the days that I'm talking about, people didn't really have electricity at all. And so if they did light up their room at night when they woke up, it would be a candle or something very subtle. Mm -hmm. Um, But today, you know, you turn on the light and your mind goes, oh, is it daytime? And it's not. So I find that very disturbing. And I tend to... Uh, not want to turn the light on at night. But if you are a person who wakes up, try to find a more uh, relaxed kind of lighting to use if you have to put the light on for any reason. Um, So, yeah, well, just know I I can send you the article that uh, talks about this. I should really just post some of these things. And I am doing that on my blog, everybody. I am posting very interesting stuff that I come across that doesn't really have to do with my favorite subjects. But anyway, so we are being microwaved, who knows how much, and do we know by whom? I mean, I know you have this extensive background in these different um, 
different arenas, but your Jade Helm work and your the article that I or the video that I came across recently that really intrigued me that you had done was about the uh, Macondo Well in the Gulf back in 2010, what we know as the BP oil spill. Mm -hmm. So I had my own thoughts about that, and your video, which I will link on this uh, podcast description, I found very, very profoundly interesting. There is a, evidently a, a very determined, calculated plan to alter the composition of the ocean. And uh, do you want to get into that video a little bit? Uh, sure. Uh, that video took about three months of research to get all the information compiled and then kind of like sorted out into a way where people, people could see what was happening chronologically in that area. But one of the most disturbing things, aside from the most obvious, was, you know, the vast amounts of oil and sludge that was released into the Gulf was the use of artificial life forms to quote unquote try and clean up the disaster. Right, and you and I had a little discussion about this yesterday. Um, the artificial life forms were designed and introduced publicly in 2010 by the J. Craig Venter Institute whose headquarters are in Maryland and San Diego. Mm, yeah, it's a company called, he's the head of a company called Synthetic Genomics. And right. what he, when this whole human genome project was going on, it's my understanding from reading into, about his background and stuff, that he wanted to either be or be at the forefront of decoding this whole human genome thing. But whereas um, some of the other scientists were doing it, you know, from an understand, from a standpoint of trying to understand how DNA works, how it's created, how it's formulated, you know, what are the genomes that make up, you know, the human being, this Venter guy was doing it from a God standpoint where he wanted to actually create new life forms. So, under, you know, um, I want to explain this, and I want to try and get across to your audience the point that once you create a life form that is completely alien, and I don't mean from outer space, to Earth, it is automatically an invasive species. Because it self-replicates or because it behaves differently, because it's aggressive? Why? Well, for all of those things, but it's invasive because it was not naturally evolving. It was created in a lab and then injected into the ecosystem. So we are speaking specifically of the organism that Venter calls Cynthia, S-Y-N-T-H-I-A. Mm-hmm. And so Cynthia is a lab created, I had heard it was a form of algae, self-replicating algae. And I believe they have put Cynthia in the ocean. Oh, they did. As such. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So would you want to tell us a little about that? Um, well, Cynthia basically was created, like you said, um, in a lab. It was using the basic foundation of the, I'm not going to pronounce this right, um, E. coli bacterium, but it was engineered, there are naturally occurring organisms, you know, in the ocean, in the saltwater environment that will feed on certain aspects of the naturally occurring oil that seeps up through nat natural cracks in the seafloor, and they'll feed on that. So what what Venter did was he re-engineered that organism, starting with the base of the E. coli bacteria, and engineered it to have a voracious appetite to go after anything that was carbon-based and to multiply. So anything that was carbon-based would be other life forms? Because, I mean, life forms are carbon-based, right? 
Right, but the amount of carbon that you know that is, um, let's say, in a molecule of oil compared to the amount of carbon that's in a molecule of some other type of living organism, you know, the ratio is much different. So this thing was designed to have a voracious appetite and to actually seek out carbon-based life forms or carbon, carbon forms in the saltwater environment. And you said that it can also accept freshwater as a habitat, right? Yes. When this thing was engineered, let me see if I can find... Hold on. For some reason, it didn't want to come up. When apologies, bear with me one second. I don't know where this document went. Well, one thing that I'll say while you're looking is that what I've learned about the coastline is it is a place where land and water meet, where fresh water and salt water meet, and the fluidity of sand, for instance, belongs on the coast because sand is like a bunch of ball bearings. It's very uh, um, fluid in its own way, even though it's a solid. The bits of sand roll over one another, and when they're mixed with water, they behave very much like water, although they are in fact, bits of rock and silica, mm -hmm. sand. And so it makes sense that Cynthia would be designed to be experimented on at first coastally, where it could then infiltrate the land and the sea. And it would be a, let's just call it a flexible kind of organism. I know that certain types of sharks can go up into rivers and they can swim a couple of miles and be good for a few days, a couple of weeks in fresh water. Um, for instance, the sharks that inhabit the East Coast, the bull sharks, and the uh, they're very aggressive. So it seems to me that Cynthia was designed kind of like one of these creatures, but it's very, you know, microscopic in size. And the important thing here is it's self-replicating. So it can just keep going once you introduce it. Yeah, it's not only self-replicating, though it's mutating. Uh, Cynthia was designed to be, let's call it, cross-platform capable. In other words, the naturally occurring microorganisms that we were talking about before are con designed by nature to be confined to a saltwater environment. Cynthia was engineered to exist in both, be able to exist in both salt and freshwater environments. Now, you mentioned iron in your video, that the iron-rich, um, an iron-rich medium helps it as well? Yeah, anything that um, has a heavy metallic content, Cynthia thrives it. So that maybe has something to do with conductivity and frequency. Um, I remember when I've been reading here and there on the Internet about scientists trying to, you know, control CO2 in the environment. They, they, are, they use iron. They want to put iron in the ocean because somehow, I can't remember right now and I feel dumb, uh, the iron does something to CO2. It inhibits C the formation of CO2. And well, in that contact with oxygen, it, it um, oxidizes. Iron oxide, rust, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But so I'm trying to figure out the prevalent mention of iron as a carbon dioxide uh, remediator. And what you're saying, that Cynthia likes iron. Cynthia That's likes metals. Metal. Iron. Okay. Yeah. Iron. But... One of the interesting things I found, Sophia, was in the researching of the Corexit 9500, which no other country, all other countries on the planet have banned the use of that. So during the, the, um, the BP spill, 
they decided to spray, you know, millions of gallons of Corexit into the Gulf. So I started looking and I found the um, material, the MDS, the material da data sheet on Corexit. And guess what one of the main ingredients is? Copper. Yeah, I remember that from your video. So, and also a company by the name of Nalco, and I'm trying to look here what the connection is to either BP or Cheney with Nalco, was that they were sitting on thousands and thousands of barrels of this Corexit 9500 that they couldn't dispose of. It, as a matter of fact, the Corexit 9500 is actually more toxic than the oil itself. Yes, that makes sense because I want to just uh, go into the idea of uh, cell barriers a little bit. The use of a solvent in the ocean would not at all benefit small life forms that are single-celled. And we have those in the form of phytoplankton and zooplankton. Phytoplankton are plant forms of algae, zooplankton, Z-O-O, -O, are animal forms of algae. Phytoplankton are what we call producers in the trophic chain. They create their own food from light. And then the animal forms of the plankton eat phytoplankton, the plant forms, and they are consumers. So as you go up the trophic chain, you start with producers that they don't go looking for food. They make their own food from light, and then you have consumers eating producers and more consumers and more consumers eating those consumers. So uh, this corrects it. it. This is all my guesswork. It's, it's, you could call it informed guessing maybe, but the corexit would have harmed the smallest creatures the most seriously. I mean, sure, if you spray a dolphin or a whale with corexit, it's not going to feel good and it might uh, become sick or something. But it's going to take an awful lot of corexit to kill a large creature, whereas it's not going to take much corexit to blur or break down the cell barrier in a single-celled creature and stop it from reproducing and, you know, destroy it altogether. So when I heard that Corexit was being used against everybody's advice, everybody's advice, uh, and it was still going to be just thrown out all over the Gulf to supposedly disperse the oil, I thought to myself, well, there you go. They're going to destroy the algae forms of life. And phytoplankton releases so much oxygen. It's a major oxygen producer on the planet. Um, I said to myself, that's it. And then they're going to throw Cynthia in the water. And they're going to say, we have our own uh, algae. Don't worry about it. But you're telling me, this was news to me, and it makes sense that they introduced Cynthia as the oil eater itself as they destroyed with Corexit the um, existing plankton forms. Yeah, and the, the Cynthia, what it does, um, like Corexit, it um, reduces the oil viscosity, breaking down the molecular structure of the crude oil that makes it more fluid and um, easier to recover. That's why these natural organisms were used in um, what's known as a MIOR process, which is a microbial enhanced oil recovery process. But this synthetic genomics went and created this artificial life form and then tweaked it. You know, so they tweaked it to where, you know, its appetite was much more voracious. It multiplies faster than the naturally occurring microorganisms in the ocean. And as I mentioned before, it's mutating. And it was the microbe that they put, it, they told us they were putting microbes in the ocean to eat oil, but they said they were natural. But you know what? Here's, what, here's how smart they are and how slick they are. I read, and I can't even begin to say I read everything, not at all. But what I was reading back then was that there are microbes that eat oil, and they occur naturally, these microbes. And I thought, well, that's hard to believe, but if you say so. And 
that these, it was suggested that these microbes be introduced into the ocean, into that part of the ocean, in order to eat the oil. And no, 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 they sprayed the core exit. And I guessed that they were going to put Cynthia in there. But you, your video taught me that they did put Cynthia in there as the oil-eating microbe. And I didn't know that, so that was very interesting. And because corrects it, you know, one of, one of the main components in that um, soup is copper. You have to wonder: Well, are they feeding this thing? What are they? What are they doing? I mean, this thing thrives in an uh, you know metal-rich or iron-rich environment, and now right. now it now it you know has the capability to go cross-platform in the environment over into fresh water, whereas the naturally occurring microbes would not survive. So I'm just throwing this out there, but maybe the copper has something to do with helping it reproduce that in a metallic frequency loaded in matrix it reproduces. I don't know. It could be, I, you know, I, I don't know, and I, you know, I'd be guessing if I tried to answer that question. But, you know, that question definitely had merit. So who, this is another huge revelation from your video. Who funded Cynthia? Um, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. I think I did this video four years ago. I think BP was one of the yes. major funders of this. Yes. yes. BP was paying for the genetic research since 2007 to um, engineer these these life forms, these artificial life forms and microorganisms. And around that time, BP changed its name from beyond from British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum, right? Mm -hmm. So it just makes me dazed that they would fund Venters Institute synthetic genomics to create this organism, Cynthia, and I don't quite, I haven't put that picture fully together, but it sounds to me, when I did my inquiries into the Gulf um, uh, spill, you could see that the Gulf of Mexico is like a, it's like a spinner as far as the world's oceans go, and it shoots out currents that go all the way up around the pole and they the gulf basically travels the world well, so the, that's when yeah, I, the gulf was the hub of the thermal hailing current of the planet which is like a convection current and you know based on from the information that i was reading and all of the documents that I pulled and everything, it seems to me that this spill was so massive and so devastating and compounded by the fact that all of these artificial means were made to not clean the oil but to hide it. So therefore they sunk it to the, you know, to the Gulf floor that it broke the thermal hailing current, which is, you know, in my humble opinion, is why you have the jet stream now, dipping all the way down to the area, you know, that we live in, Arizona, Colorado, where it used to be up, like, around the northwestern states in Canada. It's now coming all the way down because that Gulf Stream, which now has disappeared, was the warm air that kept that um, jet stream, you know, pushed up to the north. Now, since that disappeared, cold air is heavy, it's dropping down further and then going across the Atlantic. And since, you know, this accident or disaster happened, you know, we started hearing about these devastating cold winters, you know, in, Euro in Europe, especially in England and in Italy and in Russia, you know, they were having, you know, these horrendous winters that they had never experienced before. So... So the thermohaline, am I saying it right, yes. current, mm -hmm. is that an air or a water current? Water. So the, but the water current helps to create the air current, right? Yes, absolutely. They're connected. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this is very, very interesting. And 
of course, you know, here we are five years later after the Macondo well shot methane. That's another thing I want to get into, um, the methane um, release and the fears that a lot of people have that our oxygen is depleting and there's going to be a big methane, you know, explosion coming. Uh, my personal theory is they're acclimating us to methane on the subcellular level. Um, they're introducing these replicating life forms in our tissues, which are from the more like cross-domain uh, materials, archaea. They have properties of archaea, which are a different kingdom than bacteria and eukarya. Um, and they don't have defined cell walls, and they thrive on methane. They're what's called methanogens. And uh, they so maybe this methane... Uh, experience that many people believe we're not going to survive is actually going to cull us. It, a lot of people won't, a lot of, let's not even call them people, life forms are not going to make it if there's a ton of methane out there. But the introduction of organisms that like methane is perhaps going to get life on Earth acclimated to methane. I don't know what life will be left if the methane overtakes the oxygen and the CO2 on the planet because plants don't survive in a methane-rich environment, and neither do we. So, Well, life as we define it right. in the forms that we know it is, I believe, on its way already to being altered. We're in a trans- Human corridor, we're in a trans-oxygen corridor, if you want to call it that. Hmm. It's just frightening to think about because, you know, I don't know of any species, off the top of my head, not, I'm not a microbiologist or a biologist or anything like that, but of any species that can exist in parallel environments, let's call them like a species that can exist in a methane-rich environment and an oxygen-rich environment. You know, it's usually either one or the other. You know, they thrive in one and, and die in another. So, you know, how they're going to establish that balance that you speak of, that they're talking about doing, you know, of the cross-platform, you know, migration to people without killing all the life in the process, I, you know, for, I've tried to wrap my head around that, and I, I don't know how, the, how they're going to do that. And this Craig Venter, too, I mean, this guy, he's dangerous. He is working on an artificial life form, and um, I, I know I had it in that video, but this is a, a newer article where he is working on a bacterium-based artificial life form that will actually suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. How about that? So if, if it sucks the CO2 out, then what's going to be left? I mean, they don't want oxygen to be left because they want that gone. So it's going to be methane, right? Well, you'll have methane, oxygen, and I don't know what the combination of those two molecules is. But the point is, if you suck all the CO2 out of the atmosphere, you're going to end up killing all the plant life. Right. So, but this, this this guy, you know, with his synthetic genomics corporation now is being heavily funded to push forward um, with research and development in this area. It just amazes me that people on the planet can just go about their business, and even if they read snippets of this in the news or hear about it on television, they assume that because important people are doing it and it's funded, that it must be okay and that it's in their interests that this is being done, but they just don't want to know too much about it right now. <laughs> oh, here it is. I found it, Sophia, in this. Let me see if I can get you the name of this article. Scientist accused of playing God after creating artificial life by making designer microbe from scratch, but could it wipe out humanity? And it goes down here, it's quite a lengthy article. At the top of his wish list, and this is Venter, are bugs capable of producing clean biofuels 
and of sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Does it get more insane than that? Well, that's for people who believe that carbon dioxide is causing global warming and we're all going to die from that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> carbon is one of the fundamental building blocks of life on this planet. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know you know, but... I mean, this is this is crazy. This isn't. This is you know beyond. I can't wrap my head around this. So. But the the mind bending that has been done to people in scientific um, realms, you know, people who are like biogeochemists, they all believe that we need iron in the ocean in order to make biofuels. I now remember that that iron stuff is linked to the biofuel production movement. Mm -hmm. And um, they are, you can't talk them out of it. They're like doctors who think that cholesterol, that HDL and LDL are cholesterol. I put a post up on that on my blog page because it's, it has to be understood that that that's not the case. But they believe it. They read it. They were taught it. They didn't question it. And now they're doing work that they think is beneficial to humanity and all life. And they don't understand that that's not what they're doing. Isn't your brain something like 80% cholesterol? Well, cholesterol is a material that helps cells to reproduce. Um, it is a fat, a waxy fat made in the liver, it's so important to the body that it's actually a molecule that is recycled once it's used up a little bit. It's like uh, adenosine triphosphate, ATP, is rebuilt in the cells to give you your cellular energy. If you want me to drop into the cholesterol discussion, I can do it. Would you like me to? Yes, I think that's very interesting, and I'm wondering just off the top of my mind here, if that's why so many people now are feeling so tired and run down is because, you know, you talk to anybody out there between the age of 30 and 60, and, you know, they've been to the doctor and they've been diagnosed with high cholesterol. You have to take this cholesterol medication to lower your cholesterol. You know, and I'm, I'm wondering, but go ahead. I didn't mean to go All right. Off. So cholesterol, as I said, is a very important repair and rebuilding and healing agent in the body. You absolutely need it to rebuild cells for new cells to form. And what happens in the blood is that because cholesterol is a fat, it's carried in the blood on a taxi, a protein taxi. Proteins in our bodies are used as rebuilding materials themselves and as transporters of other materials. They're like the taxi or shuttle system. So you have two proteins called LDL and HDL that take cholesterol to the cells so the cell can use the cholesterol. And then they bring back the broken down cholesterol to the liver and the liver recycles or rebuilds it into a full cholesterol molecule. So the taxi that takes cholesterol to the cells is called LDL, low-density lipoprotein. Lipo means fat, and protein means protein. Now, I didn't train at Stanford or anything, but using common sense, the term lipoprotein, lipo is an adjectival descriptor of protein. So it's telling you this is a low-density protein that carries a lipid called cholesterol, LDL, low-density lipoprotein. And then the HDL that brings the broken down cholesterol molecule back from the cells is called HDL, high density lipoprotein. So it is a protein that's shuttling or taxiing the cholesterol back to the liver so it can be rebuilt into a full cholesterol molecule. I have a question. Yeah. Which one of these proteins are these drugs designed to destroy? Well, let me tell you what's okay. happening. So if you want to know why one is low density and one is high density, it probably has to do with fluid dynamics in the blood, that um, the uh, low density is carrying the big fat cholesterol and the high density taxi is bringing back the smaller cholesterol. So they're like a yin-yang. That's my guess. Mm -hmm. It's not an educated guess, but it's a guess. However, doctors are told and they believe that LDL, 
and HDL are cholesterol. They're two different kinds of cholesterol, and they're not at all. They're proteins that carry cholesterol. So now, here is the very crazy thinking. Because LDL takes cholesterol to the cells, it's bad. And because HDL takes cholesterol away from the cells, it's good. So when you do serum cholesterol, blood cholesterol readings, and you find someone who's got a high level of HDL, what it really means is his cells need repair. It, his cells need a lot of cholesterol. So you've got a big taxi fleet taking cholesterol to those cells. And you've got a smaller taxi fleet bringing it back because more is being used. But the doctors say, oh, no, 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 no. We need a high level of HDL and a low level of LDL because that's the way they're taught. So then they put the poor person on pharmaceutical drugs to lower their taxis, taking the repair agents to the cells and raise the number of taxis bringing the re most needed repair agent back. So they're breaking the loop through pharmaceuticals. And basically, if I'm understanding this right, in the context you know, of taxis and transportation, they're causing a traffic jam. They're causing major repair problems for the cells. They're impeding the repair and reproduction cycle of the cells. You can't have new cells being made if you don't have cholesterol. Our body makes three grams of cholesterol every day. And then the dietary cholesterol that you get, that has to do with the size of the lipid itself. That affects the size of it. So you want large cholesterol molecules, according to Dr. Ken, or I think his name is Rosedale, Ron Rosedale. And that's a YouTube I put up. So if you go to sophiasmallstorm.com and you'll see HDL and LDL are not cholesterol, there's a very interesting 10-minute YouTube with loads of diagrams and pictures that illustrate all this, and it is absolutely fascinating. And the fact that these people cannot even grasp that HDL is high-density lipoprotein, thank you, and LDL is low-density lipoprotein, and they think it's cholesterol, it just blows me away. So there are actually proteins is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> Hemoglobin is the protein in red blood that carries oxygen. Proteins are taxis. We have loads of proteins in our bodies, and they're all pulled and made every day from the amino acid pool. When you eat, you, you eat food and the Food gets broken down and the proteins in it get put in that amino acid pool, which is reshuffled and remade and supplied several times a day based on how much you eat, how often you eat. And then the body grabs amino acids and it goes, all right, I'm going to make this, 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 because your body gets information on a microsecond basis from all your cells. And the cells talk to the DNA, the DNA gives orders back, and what these amino acid chains, you're not going to believe this, that our body makes for repairs, minute by minute, second by second, microsecond by microsecond, repair orders and reports that are coming from the cells. Those protein chains are called, are you ready? viruses. Those are viruses. Viruses are self-made protein repair chains ordered individually per each person by the intelligence of the body. And so our body makes viruses all day and sends them all over the place to do repairs. And when they tell you that viruses are out there lurking in ponds waiting to make you sick, that's absolutely not true. The viral theory of disease is bunk. Wow. Dise disease so. is caused by bioterrain imbalance. We host loads of microorganisms, and when we get weak in certain ways, those microorganisms pro proliferate because all of nature is competitive. Every life form exists to make it to adulthood to reproduce. So, Some don't need adulthood, but go ahead. I was going to ask you, so do you think that this is connected in some way with the massive 
push and all the social engineering being done to have your kids vaccinated, get yourself vaccinated. Here are free vaccines at Walgreens and, you know, that the push is everywhere in your face. I mean, how, how do you, where do you see the connection? Is there a connection? Well, Yes, absolutely. So the way they make a vaccine, let me grab my little pamphlet that I wrote. It's my own document, and I'll send it to you. Okay. It's not for publication or anything, but it's called Understanding Viruses. And it comes from my interviews with certain people and the notes that they've given me and the uh, things that I've read and put together. So when they make a vaccine... All right, let's just take a sick person. Let's take a person with whatever, measles. He has a rash. We don't even know what it is. So the kid walks through into the pediatrician's office, and the mother says, look, he has a rash. What is it? And the pediatrician goes, easy, measles. He has measles. And this is actually what's being done in certain pediatrician's offices, the famous ones who push vaccines. They take a blood and tissue sample from the kid and correctly they say, we have the measles virus here. But what is it that they have? They have the repair materials that person has made to handle this rash. Viruses are specific to us as individuals. They are repair materials our body makes for us, for certain situations that occur all the time. We're full of viruses. We're making viruses from our amino acid pool all the time. And this tissue and blood sample is taken from this one individual, and then it is lab augmented. It's put in, it's spun in a centrifuge, and they separate the liquid from the solid. And they say, and I'm not kidding you, they say, we have isolated the measles virus now. Huh. And all they've done is separate tissue from plasma. And... Then they put that in Petri dishes and they add all kinds of fecund material to it that they know is going to invite bacterial growth. They call this producing a culture. Of, and they call it a viral culture. and It has all kinds of horrible stuff in it. And then they extend that. Well, no, first they have to preserve the culture. They have to stop the growth because they can't have it growing in their vials that they export to whatever, pharmacies and everything. So they put neurotoxins and preservatives in it. And this is where you get your aluminum, phenol, all that mercury. stuff, mercury. Then they have to make more of it. So they put extenders or adjuvants in it. They thin it out the way you would thin paint with water or paint with oil. They thin the, the, the preserved vaccine culture, as they call it, viral culture, with oils. And they used to use peanut oil. They use oil of lecithin. They use squalene now. These different kinds of oils. And then they package this in syringes and it's called the measles vaccine. And so what happens is they put this into people's bodies and we have a mouth, eyes, ears, nose. That's part of the Th1 immune system, the gateway system. We have skin. Skin is a barrier. And we also have our antibody system. That's the more, uh, you could say, complicated immune system in the body. So we have Th1 and Th2. Part of the Th1 system is the digestive tract, where there are very powerful acids and enzymes designed to break down materials that are coming into the body by way of the mouth. So proteins and oils are complex molecules that must not, under any circumstances, enter the bloodstream unless they have been addressed and broken down in the gut first. Mm. And the proteins will be put in the amino acid pool, right? And the oils will be converted to energy or whatever uh, for caloric um, calories. And there are oils that, like coconut oil, is a very important nutrient. Um, so when you inject directly into the bloodstream, these complex molecules and all this other stuff, this bacterial material that they were culturing in their lab from, you know, this blood sample they took from one person, what you're really doing is 
you are pumping very complex molecules directly into the blood and you are over, you're triggering and then over-triggering the Th2 antibody system. Because the Th2 system goes, what? Wait a minute. Why, why am I getting oil molecules and protein, full proteins? I need to, this should have been done in the gut already. What happened so to the Th1 system? It overstimulates the immune system immediately? It, it overstimulates the antibody system, and then you get loads of antibodies made, loads and loads of them, and the body goes into overdrive, and it makes antibodies for related things. And anti For instance, we make squalene in our body. It's another thing that is very important for metabolism. It's an oil molecule, and they're using it in vaccines. So when this foreign squalene comes in, the body goes, what? And the antibody system starts... Um, going after squalene. Then, then it goes after our squalene, and we have a health crisis. Oh. So, so they've done this. This is why so many people are allergic to peanuts, because they use peanut oil in the vaccines. That makes sense. Yeah. So all the food, I shouldn't say all, many of the food allergies, this tendency to be allergic to all these different things has to do with people's TH2 systems Immune system is being over-triggered and over-producing antibodies as a consequence of having been vaccinated so much. Mm -hmm. So what viruses are, are actually self-proteins. And when they inject material that your body has made expressly for you into my body or someone else's body, we don't like it. It doesn't belong there. It's foreign. It's foreign. And it's not the cause of a particular disease. Bioterrain imbalance, I've learned from people who know way more about this than I do, is the cause of what we call dis disease. Well, yeah, the word disease breaks down into dis-ease, you know, state of unease or state of imbalance. Right. So wow. this idea that vaccines are going to protect you against anything is a is a very upside down idea vaccines are a way to introduce foreign materials into your blood where they don't belong and your body goes into chaos especially if you think about it these okay once or twice maybe you'll get lucky but these children today are having these vaccine cocktails where they get measles mumps rubella together they get these combinations of agents that you would never find in nature, ever. And then they get, this is done to them, you know, 60 times by the time they're five. And these are immature, undeveloped um, immune systems. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's very disturbing. And it's disturbing that people who are, you know, wear the white coats, and administer these things, actually believe in this. Well, now, aren't they, like, pediatricians and schools and things of that, of that sort? Now, if you're refusing to have your child vaccinated, in many cases, states, whatever, you can be reported to Child Protective Services. Right, but the beauty behind that is that they can only do this as long as you sign over your straw man in your legal fiction. As Anita, I've done interviews with her on my podcast, um, Anita Whitney of Anti-Corruption Society. She was in the anti-vaccine movement and still is, but she started plumbing the whole legal fiction thing. And they can't. she tells me all the time, they cannot vaccinate you. They cannot vaccinate the person. They can only vaccinate the straw man. So when parents sign their kids up for school, well, what they've done is, because their children can't sign themselves up because they're minors, the parents have unwittingly given the warm body of the child over to the state. And if the state determines that in the context of schooling, the child must be vaccinated or that the child must be vaccinated to attend the school, then it has the right to vaccinate the child because it's got the straw man signed up. You know, I heard your um, interview. I don't remember if it was on SGT Report or, or one of the other stations, but um, I found that fascinating. 
Yeah. So really and truly, we unwittingly contract with them and we sign our sovereignty over to them by consent. Let them, yeah, by consenting that they have the right to our straw man to tell us what to do. So if you sign your kids up for homeschool, it's the same thing. You've done the same thing. So, uh-huh. yeah, they can't vaccinate us. They can only vaccinate our straw man. But if we sign over ourselves through our straw man, then they can do it. So how do you fight this? I mean, if somebody, say, say I had little kids and I'm taking them to school and they say, vaccination papers, please. And I say, no, I don't have any. And they say, well, your child has to be vaccinated. And then they call the authorities or whoever and they say, okay, well, if you're not going to vaccinate your child, then, you know, you're in violation of the quote-unquote law. How do you fight that? I mean, how do you? Okay, well, the presumption is that you've signed your kids up for the public schooling, right? And all of us do, though, right? Well, we have to not do it. Uh And we have to not register them for homeschooling either. We have to stop writing our signature everywhere. And what they're now starting to do, I've learned, is they're starting to take your thumbprint as your signature, and they're doing this by way of screens. This is a little bit over my head, so I won't even get into it now. I have to understand this better. Yeah, those are bio-APIs. Biometrics, Mm -hmm. right. But for now, when you register your car, what you've done is you've given the state the right to impound your car for whatever you you know, your parking tickets, or you're not the owner of your car. And you don't own your child as long as you sign it up for stuff. Doctors, when you take your child to the doctor and you fill out that intake form, if the doctor decides that your child needs X, Y, or Z, like chemotherapy, that 16-year-old that they chemoed, um, I have that on my blog too, Um, She didn't want chemotherapy, and her mother didn't want her to have it, but her mother was considered inept and foolish by the authorities, and because she was 16, they forced her to have chemotherapy. And chemotherapy occurs in rounds, right? Mm -hmm. So she she got through it, and she did very poorly and uh, didn't want to have it again. And her big fear is that she's having her 18th birthday, I think, this fall, and her second round of chemo was scheduled for just before her 18th birthday. Wow. So minors are very susceptible, especially through unwitting parental consent. So, Sophia, in the, in the, the example you gave, you know, when you go in and you register your car and you apply for a driver's license, If you don't register your car, then the authorities will pull you over and impound the car because it's not lawfully registered. And by the same token, I guess, you know, to some degree, a driver's license, too. Well, if you don't go down to the office and sign this form, you don't get a driver's license. So then you're not legally eligible in the eyes of the law to operate a motor vehicle. So, I mean, I would love to opt out of this, but I'd like to know how without getting my butt thrown in jail. Right. I understand. Lots of people would like to do that. And I have heard of a couple of people who successfully driven for many years without a driver's license, and the authorities have given them a reprieve. They are special cases. They've learned how to navigate all the ropes. Um, But I don't know too many people who have managed to do it uh, and not gotten in trouble. I just know of these couple of people, and I don't know how to do it particularly. But when you renew your driver's license, what they're doing is they've changed the regulations. And you see, everything is codes, uniform commercial code, I've learned. So... Um, 
when you drive and you're pulled over because you rolled a stop sign or something. So the cop is hiding on his motorcycle in the shadows and he comes racing after you and pulls you over. The first thing he says is driver's license and registration. Actually, he might say something like, did you know you just rolled that stop sign? And you'll go, I did, or you'll go, okay, I'm sorry. And he'll say driver's license and registration and you obediently produce that. That is the, that's the first step. Uh, the, by which they get you to align with and join with your straw man because that's what the driver's license reflects. It's got your name in capital letters and so does your registration. So by showing it to them, handing it to them, you have now connected yourself with your legal fiction and now they can ticket you. But there are videos on YouTube and I've seen a couple of them but I didn't know what they meant, um, what they were really about. And someone is pulled over and... The cop says, did you know you just did this? You were speeding. So the comeback is, was anyone harmed? Did I damage any property? Have I committed a crime? Ah. And they'll keep saying, driver's license and registration. No, 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 no. I'm just asking you, did I commit a crime? Did I harm anyone or anything? Did I damage any property? And the answer is no. But the cop's not going to say that. And he's going to keep asking you to identify yourself. And if you don't, if you keep, if you hold strong and you keep saying, did I commit a crime? Is there any crime that has been committed? Am I free to go? And if you keep saying this, they will let you go. Because they can't get you to produce that ID that connects you with your straw man. The second you show that to them, you're toast. So then the answer then lies in compliance or capitulation. Right. That's the where they, get, they start the process. That. Yeah. And the answer is in non-compliance and don't capitulate. Right. You ask them, what crime? What crime? Okay. So the stop sign was rolled. The uh, It was going over 55 in a, you know, 55-mile zone. So what, what crime? They'll pull you over for not using your directionals when you change lanes. What crime was committed? Good point. So this is what you have to ask them. And now, of course, there's always the risk that you'll be roughed up for, you know, not talking back or some such thing. And those are the risks people have to take. But the more people get educated, and I'm just now learning, really. I mean, it's all fascinating. But the... the Domination, the dominion they have over you is through your legal fiction, which is created through your birth certificate. That's the corporate form of you. And only corporations can contract with corporations. And because they're all incorporated, they can't contract with us as free living beings. They can only contract with us as corporations, and they make one for us from our birth certificate. You're and then talking they, about the short form birth certificate, yes. right? The one yes, with, with the number, the sequential right. number, computer number on top? Yeah, the CUSIP number or whatever it's called. Cusp ID, yeah. Yeah, and then they, um, they send you that. Uh, what I've learned is the hospital in which you're born has you fill out the long form birth certificate, and the mother is called the informant what? on that. Yeah, yeah. And then they take that thing, it's sent to the county. And there's some kind of weird ritual that goes on. Then, so they, it's like Jesus ascending from the dead. Yeah. They kill you from the long form and they resurrect you on the so short form. And then they send you the short form. And that's what's so, in some ways, you know, ironic and hilarious. Because that's your dead self. And you present that as your birth certificate. But you're really, um, you're shuttling your dead identity around and sh serving it up as proof that you were born. Wow. So what would happen, hypothetically, um, you know, if more and more people, through the type of work that people like yourself are doing in explaining this to the general public out there, if they were to demand a copy of the long-form birth certificate without that 
cuts by D number one. I can't even say for sure I've ever even seen a long form birth certificate. But what if more and more people start demanding that upon the birth of a child and start showing that document versus, you know, the short form, what you're referring to as the straw man, the, the dead man right. document? I mean, right. would that insulate us in any way, or are we just substituting one corporate identification for another? The long form is not a corporate thing, document. Mm, okay. Because I, I don't believe, anyway, I haven't seen one myself, but I know people are starting to request from the county of their birth the long form birth certificate. And there is a way, uh, I don't know it, to um, rebut your short form birth certificate and start using your long form as a live flesh and blood person. There's a way to sign your name with all rights reserved. There's a, you know, you can't, if you start putting your signature down willy-nilly on all these documents that they tell you are boilerplate where you don't even read them, you don't have full disclosure. I mean, we don't know, for instance, that when we apply for a credit card uh, through a bank, that the bank is actually using fraud in the financial system uh, through which using our name, our legal name, to make money. For instance, let's say I apply for a credit card with Bank of America and it's got a limit of $10,000 on it. Well, the credit card is issued to me in all caps, which is my dead legal fictions, my corporate self. Then the credit card, if you look at the bank's own records, and you have got to look deep because bank managers don't know this, um, the credit card is listed as a demand deposit account. That is the same classification as a checking account. So they presume that that $10,000 limit is a $10,000 deposit that I have made with the bank. Now, that's not correct. What? Yes. And then they go and they put that on their books as, Ten thousand dollars on, on deposits, yeah, yeah, which they fractionally just, lend out from there. So it's a they lend out seven to ten times that. So they yeah. can lend a hundred thousand on your credit card name. Wow! And they charge interest on that. Oh, they sure do. So they're using our self. This is how they they commoditize us. They make money instruments out of us. This is one way. This stuff's fascinating. It really is. You know, and I was the, glued to your interview when you, you know, and it was a fairly lengthy interview, and I was like, wow. You know, I've heard bits and pieces of this, but I've never heard anybody connect all the dots and explain it the way that you did. Well, I'll just say this. I do not know the depths of this the way a lot of other people know it, but I know enough to give a very superficial summary and stringing together. And maybe that's why I can do the superficial summary, because I don't know the depths. Because the people I've talked to who do know the depths, I get confused because they start going too deep. And also, too, I think, Sophia, is that because that's because when you get so far into it, you know, at, at some level, these people become compartmentalized. And they know their little, the you know, the stuff regarding their little box better than anybody else, but they can't connect it to somebody else's box in that system. You know what I mean? It's just too convoluted and too complicated. And that's right. probably and why you were able to communicate the information, you know, as well as, you know, I heard. Well, I'm just, you know, again, I know enough to string certain concepts together, but I don't know enough to drill down. And I am recommending everywhere I'm interviewed that people please follow up with interviewing somebody who's deeper into it than I am so they can get deeper into it themselves. Because mm -hmm. when I talk to Anita, for instance, and I ask her a question, she starts referring to all these documents and this act in blah, 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 and by so-and-so, and it's all, my brain is getting all scrambled. Mm -hmm. So I think we can only take this in little steps. It's been around us for a very long time, but 
we have never seen it. We never knew that we were a dead person walking around. I mean, that is really, really weird. That's creepy. That was the first thing that came into my head when I was listening to that, is that, you know, you're contracting with your dead self and not your flesh and blood self. And I was like, whoa. The Corporation Act of, what was it, 1871? Or 1868 to 1871 that you you talked about extensively. Is there a document anywhere on file that shows how they sold out the country and corporatized it? It's. I'm sure there is. Yeah, Yeah. because you know that all corporations in California, Arizona, New Mexico, you know, this is what they call the Public Regulatory Commission where all, you know, corporations, LLCs, companies, you know, have to be filed with. So is there is there like a national PRC register somewhere where somebody can find this document? Because, and the reason I ask this is because many, many years ago when I first started, you know, doing these documentaries and some, lady, some person contacted me. She says, you have to do a report on how the United States is a corporation. And I started researching it and there was a lot of information out there to support that, you know. Um, but when I started, you know, going out, well, where is the source document for this? It's either very well hidden or, you know, it's it either doesn't exist, it's some type of a virtual document, mutual agreement that these people, these Congress critters, you know, all got together and decided, okay, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to incorporate Maryland or whatever, and, you know, the, the District of Columbia will be the corporation headquarters, so to speak. I don't know if I'm explaining this correct, but is there a possibility that actually no document does exist and this was some type of a, you know, mutual agreement between the powers to be, to be at that time, not to exclude the Federal Reserve, who were in on this and said, okay, you know, basically clapped their hands and said, this is what we're going to do. People don't have to know about it. They don't have to vote on it. We're not bringing it before Congress. No document needs to exist because we don't want this coming back on us in any way, shape, or form. I don't know about that. Honestly, you would have to ask someone who knows more than I do, but I can tell you because I wrote in my newsletter about the, um, let me just get to it, the corporate uh, case that gave corporations the right to be people. So now corporations are considered persons, and it's gotten to the point where in our um, legal documents, if you refer to yourself as a person, you're making a big mistake because you're really telling them that that's your corporate self. Mm-hmm. So in 1886, the court case that I'm referring to was Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. And this all started with the robber baron Amasa Leland Stanford, who became then the creator and president of Stanford University, that we know very well. He was an active Freemason. He was also 8th governor of California. Now, that was 1861, so it predates this incorporatization of the United States. So Stanford, Amasa Leland Stanford, came to California in the gold rush, which started in 1848. And he, San Francisco boomed, of course, at that time. It went from 200 people to God knows how many, a boom town. And Stanford wanted to build a school or institution for civil and mechanical engineers on his grounds in Palo Alto. So now, that was when these two young graduates, Bill Hewlett and David Packard, (laughs) began the first technology relationship between Stanford University and outside firms, whose growth now over the past hundred years or so is what we call Silicon Valley. So Google has spent more time lobbying the federal government, Google is from Silicon Valley, than nearly any other entity. And the U.S. government funds 85% of Stanford's research. So you can see this network. 
It's like one hand feeds the other. So in this 1886 court case, um, the ruling was that defendant corporations are persons within the intent of the 14th Amendment. And what I've learned about that 14th Amendment is that was when we all became nationals of this incorporated America, whether we liked it or not, whether we knew it or not. Nationals or inventory? Both. We were all lumped. We were residents and I think even you could say citizens of states. But then we became nationals of the United States of America in this 14th Amendment. So what had happened was the um, railroad had not paid its government loans. And at that time, individuals were allowed by California law, that would be state law, to deduct mortgages and debts from taxable property value. But corporations couldn't. So if you had a debt or a mortgage, you could deduct it from the value of your taxable property and then you'd pay less in taxes, right? But if you were a corporation, you couldn't do that because this was a benefit given to real live people because at that time they appreciated live people. And corporations, remember, were public charters. They were formed only for very brief periods of time while certain things were being done right. to manage activities that benefited the public, like building railroads. And bridges and, and things like that. Yeah, and utilities. Mm -hmm. So very few corporate charters were granted, and they were heavily restricted, the corporations that were formed out of these charters. They could only engage in the activities that related to fulfilling their chartered purpose, and people governed corporations by spelling out their operating conditions, not only in the charters, but in the state constitutions and the state laws. And the penalty for abuse of the corporate charter was the end of the corporation. So... Well, we can see that's out the window. Right. So as soon as the judge in this case, and I've heard two stories, I've heard that the judge was a friend of the railroad, and he deemed the corporation, Southern Pacific, to be a person as per the 14th Amendment. And the railroad was thus able to save on its tax bill. So I also heard that the clerk of the court was a former railroad employee, and he entered a false ruling in favor of the railroad, that the judge didn't actually even rule that. But regardless, either the judge or the clerk or both were rewarded by the railroad most likely. And the 14th Amendment reads, this first section of it, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So the judge said the corporation gets the same right as the word person in that amendment. And now corporations can thrive. They can act like people more. They have more protections even. But the amazing thing is that corporations are just organizations on paper. And they, even though they're giant, if you can't punish them. You can't punish this fictitious entity. You can make it pay a fine, but they have tremendous wealth in, you know, huge, you know, flanks of attorneys, and they put both to use when they fight things like lawsuits. Interesting, because uh, tech corporations are actually intangible entities. So, right. So, you know, but they're now protected by the same laws as um, tangible entities are, such as people. And another interesting thing that I found um, is that in the beginning, when corporations were founded and the tax laws and the, the tax laws, not the tax code, but the tax laws specifically stated that individuals were not subject to income tax. And, and I'm paraphrasing this. 
corporations, because as you pointed out, they were established, you know, for limited periods of time to perform specific functions for the general good, you know, such as utilities and roads and whatever, okay, they were the only entities subject to income tax, not the people. But somehow, somewhere, you know, this spread where now income taxes are not, not only are individual people subject to it, they're burdened by it. Many of them are broken by it. So, you know, I'm just in my head, I'm listening to what you're saying, I'm just fathoming how everything has been completely turned around in front of our eyes, but with, the, with a, a veil, the wool pulled over so we didn't see what was happening. I, I don't know. Right. We've been tricked through paperwork into a whole different kind of existence that's very restrictive and that bleeds us of anything we manage to accumulate, which, you know, ironically for most people is things like savings, <laughs> money, property. which is fake in itself. Right. And a little bit of property, a little bit, but... Many people, you know, property wears out, not real estate necessarily, but once you buy a car after you've driven it for a few years, it's no longer that valuable, and the stuff you buy gets old. And um, But property is a way to um, build money. For instance, I'm going to tell you something. This is wild. Why am I yakking away like this? But um, I have gotten to know a couple of people who run you know, high-end uh, designer resale stores, all right? So I was, I was stunned to find out, and Jackie Onassis did this too, Jackie Kennedy. They, these women buy these very expensive clothes, and their husbands agree, their very rich husbands agree, okay, I'll pay for your wardrobe, whatever, because men never even imagine how much money women can spend on shoes and clothes, right? Mm -hmm. So, I these window. They stop. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay. The women buy, rich women buy very expensive clothes that they never wear or wear once or just hang in their closet. And then they resell them in these resale stores where they get maybe half the money for them. But the clothes are thousands of dollars to begin with. So somebody I know who runs such a store tells me that the SUVs pull up with racks of clothing from the richest parts of town. And the women just have their maids sell the clothes they're put on consignment in the resale stores, and the women get the money and put it in their bank accounts. Okay. So this is a form of money laundering in your own marriage, right? And apparently Jackie Kennedy did this. Joseph Kennedy, the father of Jack Kennedy, her husband, paid for her clothes while she was a first lady, and she had very fantastic clothes. Now, many of them were gifts from designers, but she also bought clothes. And she would wear them once or not wear them at all, shoes as well, and they all went to her resale boutique on Madison Avenue, and she would put the money in her account. And she did this to Onassis. She would go to Paris and buy 70 pairs of size 6 shoes from, like, um, I don't know what designer it was. Oh, yeah, it was Charles Jourdan. And she would send them all to Madison Avenue and sell them. Wow. Ne never wear them, yeah. So... And then you, you know, don't pay a tax on that either, do you? I mean, that's in retail, I think actually you have to. Um, but regardless, it's crazy that there are so many creative ways to make money. I, we were talking about real property, and here was just something I learned that the the very rich do, and um, I just found it to be rather curious. It is. But when you're buying suits, you know, from Nordstrom that are $8,000, a skirt and a jacket, and you don't even wear it, and you take it to a clothing store where you can sell it for 3000 that's still plenty of money to put in your account. Yeah. Wow. 
Yep, a new business to get into. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there's creative ways to to do all kinds of things with this thing called money and, um, you know, property. But we are being fleeced. We are used, I believe, um, as wealth-creating machines. It doesn't matter how little or how much wealth create, we create. There are tricks and schemes to take that from us, however much it is. You know, it'll be eventually bled from you, and you'll end up very confused and depressed and um, disconsolate and um, bereft of, of what you thought had value to you. You know, they're, what they're going to do with our houses is pretty amazing. People are getting the robocalls all the time. That, do you want a free energy assessment? Mm -hmm. And it's the utility company, and they, they promise to send someone over who will help you find ways to conserve energy in your house because we're in an energy crisis, right? And so you say, all right, and the guy comes over, and he's taking, an, a, a, you know, note-taking. This is data compiling of all the things that you don't have. You don't have the certain kind of dual pane, um, energy conserving windows, and you don't have the right whatever insulation, water heater, uh, machine, washing machine, refrigerator. They're not smart. You have toilets that are, you know, three and a half gallon tanks, and they should be 1.2 or at least 1.6. And so an inventory is made of your house and it goes in a database and then you're not going to be able to sell your house until you come up to code and the code will all be you know very very specific and restrictive the new codes for houses and you'll have to live in your house that'll be fine but you won't be able to sell it until or unless you upgrade it to the tune of thousands and thousands of dollars that you don't have Wow. That, that reminds me of a, something ridiculous that happened when I was living in New Mexico. You know, there's not much water in New Mexico. And uh, the city, the city uh, spearheaded this years, one-year drive for everybody to conserve water. Must conserve water. Can't wash your car. Can't water your lawn. Can't, you know. Not that we were in any kind of drought, but we had to conserve water because there's only a finite amount. So after the end of the year, there was this big blurb on the news, on the front page of the Albuquerque Journal and stuff, you know, um, New Mexico's water drive a complete success. And then it goes in, you're reading how um, New Mexicans managed to save 35% um, of the water consumption over prior years. And then you read down at the bottom, it says, unfortunately, due to this cons conservation effort, the water utilities have not generated the revenues they need to operate, so therefore, we're increasing your water bill by 30%. Wow. I see. This is, really? <laughs> what incentive after something like that does anybody have to conserve anything? Because, you know, they tell you on the one hand, you have to conserve. This is a limited resource. You have to conserve it. And then they turn around, well, revenues and profits are down, so we're going to have to raise your rates for these very same utilities we forced you to conserve. What? Yeah. I know. It, they get you coming and going. That's it. That's and the it. thing is, we are very obedient and we're very compliant mm -hmm. and we're very worried. And we, we care. And they don't. They are the utter opposite. Yeah, unfortunately, you're right. You're 100% right. It's so, all about profit. You know, it's not about the resource itself. There are people I know in neighborhoods that are by the beach who they tell me the water department drives by every day and looks to see if they're watering. And, you know, California is said to be in a drought, which I believe is all artificially created. There's primary water under the ground, but we don't have access to it. So I have a primary water post or two on my blog. SophiaSmallStorm.com takes you directly to the blog. But at any rate, this one woman told me that she's not allowed to water her palm trees. She has five huge palm trees on what's actually a very small lot. 
And three of the trees are on the corner on what looks like, you know, city grass, but it's actually the homeowners. It's, you know, parts of the sidewalk have plants growing on them, but the homeowner plants them there and has to water them. So she cannot water these palm trees, which are enormous and worth thousands and thousands of dollars because there's a shortage of water. So the water department told her, sorry, you can't water these trees. And she was telling me that. She told them, bill me, bill me. I can't let these trees die. What's going to happen? As the trees die, they could fall onto her house, right? Mm -hmm. They could do a lot of damage. Um, But you're still not allowed to water them. And they do things like they compare your water use this year, this month, to your water use last year, last month, the same month. Mm -hmm. And this woman told me she wasn't, they didn't live there last year, and the previous owners were not there. So it's not fair to compare a family of four to zero. But the water department doesn't care who lived there before. Oh, so you mean if the house was vacant the year before she bought it, they're comparing her current water usage with the water usage of a vacant house? Yeah, with the last owner. Oh, my God. How it's ridiculous just, is that? It's all ridiculous. All ridiculous. So under that method of reasoning, she's not allowed to use any water at all. Uh, Hardly any. That's right. Oh, my gosh. And guess what the water department is recommending? This is what people have been telling me. They recommend you take out your grass and you put in AstroTurf. (laughs) So people have done that and... They send their little dogs out to the yard, and the dogs pee on the astroturf, and it's not natural. And the dogs are getting from squatting, especially the female dogs, um, on this, you know, bacteria-ridden astroturf. They're getting um, pelvic urinary infections. Yeah. And so then you take the dogs to the vet. I'm hearing this from homeowners who have astroturf because the water department told them they have to have it. And the vet says, well, I'm sure you hose off the AstroTurf, don't you? And the homeowner says, and I'm not allowed to. This is why I have it, because it's AstroTurf. I couldn't water my grass. They're not going to let me water my AstroTurf. Isn't it amazing? Wow. You know, wow. So Things are so backwards and upside down and, and wrong and... There's no, there doesn't seem to be any common sense involved in, in especially any of the, these um, regulation making and the law making and stuff. No common sense involved at all. Right. The regulatory agencies create more and more restrictive codes. There are 450 agencies. There are um, in the U.S. government, I'm told, and there are. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of codes. And we don't know any of these codes, and we can't possibly keep up with them. So we have to start learning how to be, how to operate as freer people, and how to get in the face of all this code making and, you know, stand up to it. What a monumental task. I know, and there are a lot of people who aren't going to want to do it because they just want... See, here's what I've discovered. People want to get through life with the fewest hassles possible. And they just want to... Okay, I just want to do my thing. I want to get to my retirement where I can enjoy a few years of, you know, relaxation based on what I've built up to live on and enjoy my grandchildren, take a few trips, and then that'll be it. And they're not interested in the welfare or the unfolding of the society. Well, they're too busy trying to probably get through everyday life. As you mentioned, you know, pay my bills, go to my job, pick up the kids, come home, make dinner, clean the house, drive them to the house. I mean, it's, life is not simple anymore. Right. And I think also that We don't live long enough to see the effects. I mean, our grandmothers saw 
you know, fast cars and the jet engine and the television come into being. And we've seen the computer age and, I mean, 3D printers that will print goods that we buy online. That, to me, is magical and unthinkable, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the 3D printers that will print out human organs like a kidney. I should put that one on the blog, but they printed a kidney. Well, that's how they're um, actually modeling and creating a lot of these artificial life forms as well. They're being, you know, where they used to have to use electron microscopes or whatever and actually stitch together the DNA to to make these life forms that now they're modeling it on computers and they're able to send it via the Internet to a lab halfway around the world where that life form can then be assembled in that lab. Well, I mean, all I can think of is why isn't it hacked, or maybe it is, you know, if it's going over the Internet. Mm -hmm. But it's hacked to begin with. The, The principles are hacked already, you know. But it is. It's hard to believe. It's... I know plenty of old people who've never even touched a computer, and they don't want to. Mm -hmm. And they have repudiated this whole computer age for good reason. They can't function in it. They don't want to be a part of it. But it's our age, you know, and we see the pros and the cons, and we don't want certain parts of it. But there are enough people out there in the transhuman corridor who want it and who want to participate in it. And in this last few pages of the newsletter or paragraphs I wrote about, I will post this newsletter because I owe it to anyone listening to this, about the new code. We live by these uniform commercial codes, Mm -hmm. but there's a new code. They are building computer, writing computer codes that are self-correcting, right? Yeah. So um, these, as I call them, the Google geeks from Silicon Valley, the products of these techno corporations that Amasa Leland Stanford started, these guys are, you know, the people who are going to be our next generation of lawyers because they will be the only ones who know how to write and know how to understand codes, because we're all going to be doing what's called decentralized contracting through computers. We're not going to be getting our insurance from an insurance company. We're going to be getting our insurance from each other through these group um, money hubs that are funded by us, and it's going to be considered very clean and transparent and, you know, of the people but it's all going to be governed by computer code. And they are building a distrust of government and institutions. You can see this in our society. And they want the Internet to become the um, platform from which payments are generated between people and contracts are made between people and all of the the cryptography is is available for anyone to inspect it's a public ledger that's called a blockchain or something so they want to post online all of the complex stuff complicated stuff that only they can understand and they'll call it you know what do they call it free, freeware, or something like that. Open source, right. And so they, by and through this, they're going to remake society. Hmm. So I'm I'm going to read this. Okay, you were going to ask something? No, I'm just like, hmm. You know, I'm I'm a proponent of open source software because anybody can look at the coding. 
Okay, and you know, you have these proprietary companies like Apple and Microsoft and Cisco that write all of this code and all of the, this programming into the devices and computers and hardware we use every day, and we don't know the back doors that are in there. We don't know what type of um, malicious software or even hardware now I'm finding out in some cases that's been installed in this equipment. So. And because it's proprietary, you can't look at it. But with open source, you know, if somebody's putting something malicious in there, and again, this is coming from a computing standpoint, not a government standpoint, because I don't believe government is striving towards transparency in any way, shape, or form. But with the open source, you know, if somebody goofed or intentionally put something that could be classified as malware in there, it's going to be all over the place in a heartbeat. And everybody's going to know about it. Well, everybody will know about it as long as somebody can spot it. And the thing that I'm worried about is that in this decentralized contracting, you will get, well, you won't have um, corruption in the way that you have it now in government because code is considered superior to flawed human thinking and code is egalitarian. But... The thing is, code is just a bunch of symbols, and when we don't understand the symbols, and only certain people do, it's just as complicated as the UCC was, is, and needs lawyers that we pay to have them explain it to us. My question would be, who's going to be in charge of the, the regulatory aspect of this transparent open cord coded, you know, open source software, is it going to be the government or is it going to be transparent to everyone? It's going to, the code is going to be self-correcting. Well, that's, that's AI, where, right? Yes, that's where they're giving it higher billing than they give themselves. But they're going to, uh, they're going to write it and create it to make it self-correcting. And when it's, when it runs itself, it generates itself, it's going to play no favorites. And if you eliminate control by people, you eliminate bribing, favoring, sympathizing, siding with. This is all the stuff that we call corruption. Right. But I also happen to think that this code is going to replace the code that we ha live by now, which is uniform commercial code, and nobody's going to understand it, and only the Google geeks will understand it, and we'll be at their mercy. Once and AI starts reprogramming itself, which is the basic nature of AGI, artificial general intelligence, anyway, okay, you lose the control of the logic that goes behind it because eventually the software that's programming or reprogramming or evolving itself will evolve too fast and too complicated for average humans, nor normal humans, to be able to decipher it. Right. And even the Google geeks may not be able to keep up with it. No. And they call this wild AI. Yeah. They, they want to head off and block the possibility of wild AI. They're not going to be able to do that. I mean, I've read too many papers and done too much research that, you know, once this thing is unleashed on a, you know, complex, distributed, global network, there's no containing it. It will learn exponentially faster through a process called deep learning, okay, than the human mind can. It'll respect no national boundaries. It'll respect no corporate boundaries at, at a given point. And that's where you get to singularity, where, you know, the AI then, you know, decides on its own to break away, how can I explain this, make decisions that no longer involve the human life element on the planet. It will make decisions that benefit itself. Right. And it will change its parameters as it sees fit. So we're, we can't control it. We can't no, head it off. These people are so arrogant with their hubris that, well, you know, we developed it, therefore, you know, 
we are its God, we can control it and we can contain it, the sheer nature of the type of artificial intelligence, wild AI, that they're talking about will become uncontrollable. They're not going to stop it. It's going to exponentially outthink the human mind. So, how are you going to fix this? Well, I guess you don't. And at that point, the tables will be turned and technology will be will have the upper hand. And we will be, by then, so reduced and brainwashed that we'll be very happy to um, serve it. We'll be happy to be the serfs for the technical... Um, intelligence. Humans that, will exist as nodes on this global yeah. AI neural network. That's it. You know, and that's what I've been screaming from the rooftops. If, you, if we don't put a stop to this thing, this is going to go out of control and it's going to spin out of control really fast. Really fast. Well, I guess our next show will be on how we put a stop to it besides screaming from the rooftops that it's happening. Maybe. Since, since the Google geeks are worried about it, too, maybe we should befriend them. <laughs> the priests of science? Well, it's a, it's a suggestion. I it mean, is I don't a, know. It's a good suggestion. It's a good See, the way I see this whole thing evolving is that, you know, things like science and government and... Let's just look at science and government to make it simple, are now transforming into religions where the scientists and the geeks, let's call them at Google, are going to hold the priesthood in those religions. You know, they are the barrier between the God of what they create and us peons roaming around the earth. You know, they are the communication platform between the two. And I don't know that they're going to, going to give that up or share that willingly. Because once you um, elevate yourself to a deity, it's very hard to step a couple rungs down off that ladder. Just, just a thought, you know, it's just a thought, but I think it's a good idea what you propose is to befriend them. Or well, I guess, I mean, they are human beings too right now at this point. So if they're worried about it and we're worried about it, maybe we should share our worries. I think that's a very good idea. So find a Google geek and we'll interview him. <laughs> But anyway, this has been great fun, and um, I hope listeners were okay with the relaxed unfolding of this discussion. I very much enjoyed interviewing you myself, and um, I'd love to do it on a regular basis. Oh, I enjoyed it too, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you in front of your audience. Well, you're very welcome. I'm sure they're going to rave about you. So I look forward to posting this, and I'm going to have um, the link to DJ's oil spill video and um, maybe this newsletter that I've been discussing and some of the other things. We wandered all over the map in this interview, but those are the interviews I like, actually, so there. <laughs> well, it's your show, so you can, you can do it any way you see fit. All right, well, DJ, thanks, and see you again soon, and have a very good weekend. All right, Sophia, you have a good one, too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.